Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples, and as they watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and, he, and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and saw where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who had heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. In that first reading, we hear Samuel learning how to listen for God's voice. Samuel was the last of the judges of Israel. Israel had the patriarchs, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joshua. And then they went into a period of judges. And these judges comprised of many religious leaders that tried to help and guide Israel. And one of those judges was Deborah. And so oftentimes, people will say the old ways of the Jewish faith and Christianity are all patriarchy and they never honored women. Well, that's just not historically accurate. Deborah was a woman and she was a judge of um, Israel. And so our world, sadly today, tries to divide people. And really what we learn in these readings is it's important for us to listen to the voice of God to find that tranquil place where we can be attentive to God's voice. Every one of us is essential in God's eyes. Every one of us was created for some purpose and some mission. And he wants us to be extremely happy. There's basically four vocations. You have the married life, the dedicated single life, the religious life, and then the priesthood, basically. And God invites us all to pursue one of those vocations. And every vocation, no matter what vocation it is, it always entails the cross to some degree. I know in my own discernment, when I was trying to listen to the voice of God and see what he wanted me to do, as you all know, I was in a master's program at Purdue, studying engineering, ultimately got the master's degree, and I was dating this very nice woman. She was a very beautiful person, very good Catholic, and I was trying to discern and say, you know, God, what do you want me to do? And a priest gave me sage advice. You see, because, <clears throat> we'll get back to the story, but if we understand the vocation of marriage, when two people get married, if they really understand the vocation, they're thinking, boy, this is exciting. I'm going to help this person get to heaven. And the other person is hopefully saying the same thing. This is exciting to live this vocation together as a team so that we can love each other, reveal God's love, his own covenant, covenantal love for his people, Israel, and, God, and Christ's own love for the church, and reveal that love through our family. We're blessed with children to help them and teach them un to understand just how much God loves them and we can be those agents in the world. So mathematically, the way my mind works, I said, you know, if I get married, and have children and, and blessed with a large family, think of the geometric progression. Think of how many people that will influence in 400 years. You know, just think of that. Instead of having two kids, you have four or six kids. Geometrically, that's gonna be huge. But then the engineering mind kicked in and said, oh, if I can convince one person 
to live my life, to live their life as I would have lived it, then God breaks even. <laughs> and if I can convince two people, God comes out way ahead. But the idea is, so I'm discerning this, what does God want me to do? This person seemed to be like a really wonderful person. And a priest gave me sage advice. He said, does this person somehow complete who you are? In other words, can you imagine yourself being happy if, if she's not next to you? And if the answer to that question is no, God wants you to be with that person. That's your vocation. But if you can imagine yourself being happy without her next, that, next to you, then just maybe God might be inviting you to be a priest. Didn't really make the decision necessarily any easier, but it gave really wonderful insight into what really matters. You see, this is what our world needs more than anything right now. We need people to focus on the eternal realities and to try and share the good news of Jesus Christ through love and compassion and understanding. And we must tear hatred from our hearts. We must not allow all the stuff going around us to rob us of our peace because God is there to take care of us. On one level, it doesn't really matter so long as we stay close to Christ and listen to his voice. Paul is enjoining us in that second reading to live moral lives. If we live a moral life, we spare ourselves a great deal of pain and anguish and anxiety. We look what happens when the devil is successful at destroying families. The devil is uh, successful at getting people to live a life that opens themselves to addictions and how those addictions not only damage the individual, but their families as well. To live a moral life is to just listen to God's words. How many parents just wish that their teenagers always listen to them? How many parents just really wish that, the, the, that their children would understand how much they have learned from their experience and that they really are there to help them? But boy, God makes us stubborn. Why is it so hard for us to listen? And you know, I, I would venture the guess that there's a lot of Catholics when they got married weren't thinking like I was laying it out just like that. And that's okay, because God doesn't care about our past. It's from this moment on that God invites us to this deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And the deeper our relationship with Jesus Christ, it just means the deeper our joy will be. He's not just any guy. He's God. He's the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if we listen to that voice and follow his ways, he's going to get us through anything. We don't need to be afraid of anything. And so we ask the Lord, to help us hear his voice. But for us to do that, we need time to hear it. We need to find those moments in our lives where we can just be quiet and calm and listen to God's voice. That may be very difficult for a busy mother, and that's okay, <laughs> because they're doing that work that God wants them to do. Busy mothers are not called to be contemplatives. I'm rather convinced of that, all right? But there'll come a time when we will be able to listen more attentively. And as I say at Mass, pray, brothers and sisters, that the Lord accept this sacrifice at my hands and yours, right? What does that mean? All your sufferings, all your questions, all your pains, all your difficulties, offer them on the altar when I offer the sacrifice of the Mass. When we're setting up the altar, that's just not a time to twiddle our thumbs and think, oh, this is taking a long time. Use that time to reflect on those things that, are, that you're struggling with, the questions that you have, and just offer them to God. I'm convinced one of the greatest prayers that we can just say to God, help. Help. Help me understand. Help me do what you would have me do. And then, my friends, we hear in the doxology, or in the uh, preface, I get to sing it today. It's good. 
The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give him thanks. It is right to give God thanks. It is, let us give him thanks and praise. It is right and just. You see, if children understand the great sacrifices that their parents made, food, shelter, care, trying to guide them, giving them usually at great expense even in education, it is right and just that those children give their parents thanks. And in the Mass, what is the Eucharist called? The word, the very word Eucharist means thanksgiving. As we gather at Mass, it is that perfect act of thanksgiving. And the word liturgy, if you look it up in like a Greek dictionary, if you were a Greek person and you'd heard that word lit liturgia, it would mean the people's work. In the pagan religions, the people's work was doing their temple sacrifices and stuff like that. But Christ perfected it. And so our work is to come and give God thanks for the world. To be that shining example, that light on a hill. The light to the nations, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church. Lumen Gentium, we are called to be a light to the world. We must tear hatred out of our hearts, be agents of love, reconciliation, mercy, goodness, truth, and beauty. If we live that way, I believe that we've heard his voice and it's impacted our lives. This is what we must do, especially in light of our nation. It needs great healing. And we need to make sure that we have our heads on straight and can see clearly enough of what's at stake. And it's not a better economy or more jobs or better health care. All those things are good. What's at stake is human souls. We need to focus on those eternal realities. And if we focus on those eternal realities, it changes everything. So my friends, let us pray that we can listen attentively to the voice of God, that we can live moral lives, live lives of chastity and purity. Don't give in to all the nasty stuff that's out there that's so seductive, but to do what we can to help the world recognize all that is true, good, and beautiful. And the more completely we do this, the deeper our joy will be. Remember our mission, you know, guiding families to, to uh, pursue the truth and live it. That's our mission statement here at the parish. But let us put that into practice so that we, hopefully, all of us can draw back at least one person this year. One person back to the church so that they can do what is right and just. That we can get them away from doing that which is wrong and unjust by not giving thanks to God. Our world needs prayer. Don't underestimate the importance of your mission in trying to encourage that. God loves you, and so do I. Let us pray that we can grow in our love for one another, even for those who don't love us, even for those who hate us. That, my friends, is not natural. But that is the supernatural life we are called to live. And so like Peter, let us listen to God's voice and follow the Master. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us stand as we profess our faith in the only God who can save. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now we bring our prayers of intercession before the Lord. For the church, that as we celebrate our Lord's epiphany, she may continue to manifest and reveal the saving power of Christ to our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, our, hear prayer. our prayer. For all nations throughout the world, and that all work for lasting peace and mutual respect for human dignity, and not be motivated by greed and self-interest, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear, Lord, our, hear prayer. our prayer. That we may all be open to God's plan in our life, and listen more intently to hear His voice and be more attentive to his call. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For Ralph Zaluski, the intention of this Mass, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all our personal intentions found in our parish book, and that our parish may guide all families to pursue the truth and live it. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that all corruption be uncovered and those responsible for it lose their power and are replaced by leaders who respect life, religious liberty, and all that is in accord with natural law. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For more vocations to the priesthood, religious life, faith-filled marriages, and the dedicated to single life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, that they may come to know the fullness of God's joy in heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to the pandemic and for all those who strive to keep us healthy and secure. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of the people gathered here before you, those spoken and those kept in the silence of our hearts. Answer them insofar as they meet our deepest needs and are in accord with your holy and divine will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 